Hi, Andrew from Connected Digital World here. Ubisoft will shortly be releasing the next in their Assassin's Creed game franchise, Assassin's Creed Unity, set during the French Revolution. Ubisoft invited us to Paris to take a look at the game and to interview some of their key development people. And all gameplay footage was captured from the Xbox One version of the game. Enjoy. So, uh, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us your role? Yes, my name is Alex Amancio, I'm a creative director on Assassin's Creed Unity. Tell us a little bit about Assassin's Creed Unity then. Alright, uh, Unity was from day one, uh, supposed to be the first fully next generation Assassin's Creed. And um, it was also uh, the second thing that we decided was it was going to be a co op game. Um, so, uh, you know, if you look we go back to 2007 when the first Assassin's Creed was released and I think if you take Assassin's Creed 1 and 2 and, and sort of put them together we can safely say that those two games sort of redefined the action adventure genre for the previous generation. I mean so much so that uh, old uh, style action adventure titles like Prince of Persia which we also made became obsolete. Right? And every time you sort of have a, a generation jump, I think that you need to sort of uh, set the standard and uh, shuffle things around a little bit to sort of redefine what, what the genre is going to be for the next generation. This is what we attempted to do with Unity. Uh, so we didn't want to, um, you know, modify the core of the experience because we, we feel that that is unique and that is very strong. But however, we wanted to change the actual execution of that core experience. And, I mean, we have three core pillars in AC. We have navigation, we have stealth, and we have combat. All of those three pillars have been completely redone. Navigation is a lot more fluid. Uh, uh, I mean, it gives you more control. Um, we've even added a new input that allows you to control the send down, the parkour down, instead of just parkouring up, which, um, you know, you don't need to rely on jumping down a, into a haystack anymore. You can actually you know, parkour down a building. Combat is a lot more complex. It's a deeper mechanic. Uh, you can no longer automatically counter and the reason that we made this more complex and a little bit more deeper and more challenging is the fact that players will always follow the path of least resistance. If the path of least resistance is combat, every mission will end in combat. And what we really want is favor our stealth loop. Uh, but to do that, we also completely redid our stealth loop. So essentially, again, giving player more control by adding uh, a dedicated stealth button, which actually gets you in a crouched position, you make less sound. And because we know that when you're in stealth mode, you want to be stealthy and you want to be agile, you don't snap to walls anymore, right? So it gives you more control, reduces a little bit of the friction frustration that we maybe had before. Uh, we changed the way that uh, NPCs perceive you. You actually have a last known position marker now. That way you can actually uh, try to, uh, you know, gamify the, the hide and seek you know, game with the guards and try to lead them into places. You know exactly where they're going, you can trap them, you can ambush them. And we also changed the way that, um, you know, uh, you perceive guards seeing you. So before, I mean, you might, might have thought you were being very stealthy and you're just sneaking around, but there's a guard standing maybe three meters behind you that you hadn't seen that spots you. Now we actually have a little belt around the player that appears that shows you if some guard is spotting you behind you, for example. Just gives you more, again, it's more control, more visibility, uh, try to make the experience uh, a lot more smooth, smoother. But this is the low level stuff. Then you have the whole mid-level uh, interaction with the game world, which uh, is also completely different. Not only uh, are the missions different, they're more open-ended, they give you more control. Uh, we can do this because now that we have uh, customization for the main character, like skills and different gear elements that actually impact gameplay, it allows us to make more open-ended missions because you can play those missions the way you want to play them and reinforce that way you want to play with skills and with gear. But also, even the structure of the world itself, how, how the game is consumed. Um, instead of having 90% main story and 10% side content, uh, it's about 30 or 40, then 60 or 70, right? Not to say that our main path or story is shorter, it's the rest that's bigger. And the reason we made it bigger is because it's relevant. So when I'm talking about side content, I, I don't mean stuff like, uh, you know, mini games. I mean core stuff, stories. You can find, explore Paris, find your own stories, have your own activities. And all of those different activities, they all benefit Arno. Everything you do has an impact on the way Arno progresses. You get money, you get skills, you get skill points that you can use to buy skills, you get gear, you get weapons. Each of these elements helps you in Arno's progression from novice to master assassin. So it's all relevant. So hopefully, uh, and we've already started seeing this in playtests, is that um, everybody's path through Paris is different. 
before, when you, we looked at a heat map, because we, 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 we have heat maps from uh, playthroughs from actual players from all the previous games that we get data. And it looks a little bit like highways through the city. And you actually see that most players follow the same paths along the city. It's almost like there's a linear game inside the open world game. When we look at a heat map from Unity, it's total chaos. And that for us is perfection. This is what we wanted. It's actually being played like a true open world game, like a systemic uh, sandbox. Tell us a little bit about the story and tell us about Arno. Who is he? So Arno is a really cool character. It was, it was really tricky to create Arno because since AC Unity is the first in a new cycle of Assassin's Creed games, because it, it is the, 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 you know, the first new gen title, we really wanted to have a fresh start for the brand, like uh, reintroduce the brand for old fans and for new fans alike. So Arno needed to have that sort of uh, innocence that would allow you know, players to learn about the Assassins, the Templars, the conflict through his eyes. Uh, we also needed a very charismatic character. Uh, Arno has a, an awesome sense of humor. It's very sharp humor. That sharpness translates even to the way he moves, to his fight style. He's very, you know, no nonsense. He will go for that kill strike very quickly. It's very deadly as an assassin. So, uh, and he's motivated by a, a desire for redemption. So something happens early in the game that um, sort of gives him this, uh, this, this guilt and he feels that he needs to embark on a redemption quest. The assassins, at least at the beginning, are a means to an end for him. And, you know, they're, they're, they're the, the means through which he will actually attain this redemption. And, you know, the story is really about, uh, about Arno's redemption quest. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the French Revolution is actually a backdrop to this story. And, uh, you know, this is a decision that we consciously took because we wanted to avoid, first of all, we wanted to avoid the Force Cup effect, where for some reason your main character is part of every single important element of a certain, you know, uh, event. And second of all, we also wanted to avoid uh, it becoming sort of a checklist. Oh, we need to have this event because it's, it's about the French Revolution. You have this and that and that. Some elements are really interesting to read about, not so fun to play. So by using it as a backdrop, we actually use it to punctuate really cool parts of the narrative, to reinforce. We even sometimes use them as a metaphor for different elements that are happening. And it never feels like a nuisance. It always feels like it's, it's contextual and it's part of it. And obviously, you've talked about bringing co-op in. Do you want to talk about the different parts of co-op and, and the challenges you guys had there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, when we began, we didn't know what co-op meant for Assassin's Creed. Co-op can be many different things. Uh, some games like Left 4 Dead, for example, uh, you know, the, the world itself is the main co-op aggregator. It hits you with so much challenge that, uh, you know, you need to band together. You know, other games like, uh, you know, Splinter Cell has done this before, Army of Two, you know, sometimes have artificial gating where you need to have people, you know, turn a lever at the same time to open a door. This was not what we wanted for Unity. What we wanted was, uh, and we found out, like, as we started playing and testing, that we wanted to reproduce the Assassin's Creed experience, the solo experience, this new gen solo experience that we were working on, but uh, with pals, with up to like three people, uh, uh, up to three friends, so for a total of four. And uh, when we started testing this and, and trying to figure out what worked and what didn't work, we realized that when characters were complementary, they had more fun. So uh, you know, if your if your version of Arno had a little bit more of a uh, uh, talent in stealth, and for example, mine had a little more talent in fight, then we would sort of complement each other and play differently. You would tag enemies, you would sneak in, I would sort of get into a fight, I would, I would save you. So um, that is the main reason that we started looking at customization, right? By adding customization, by allowing you to skew your Arno in different paths, it uh, reinforced this uh, complementarity. So this is how sort of co-op came to be. And then we decided uh, to, to start testing different types of missions. We, we realized that very linear missions were not fun because once you played them once, it felt very uh, construed, very constructed. Uh, and we realized that by making missions open-ended, uh, you know, 360 degree approaches, black boxes, this was really fun because players really use their imagination and they like playing and replaying and replaying them. And uh, we also realized that linking missions narratively together was not a good idea. Because if, for example, you're playing with your friends and uh, one day you can't make it, you go to play the next day, there are two sequences ahead, what do you do? Do you, you know, skip ahead or do they replay something they've played? By making every one of these missions standalone narratives with a beginning, a middle, and an end, very simple objectives, uh, players really didn't mind playing and replaying and replaying. It didn't feel redundant. So we ended up with two types of, uh, two types of co-op missions in the game. The first ones are called Brotherhood missions. These are large black box type missions, very open-ended, very replayable. They're always based upon uh, a strong historical character and or 
strong historical event. And then we have the heist missions, which are um, uh, still very open-ended in the way you approach, but they're more stealth missions. The idea is that you need to sneak into an area, find the treasure, steal it, and escape without being detected. Every time you're detected, you, your loot bar goes down. And you never know, you don't, you don't know what your, your, uh, your uh, friend's loot bars look like. So you're always trying to guess whether you're playing better or they're playing better, because we only reveal them at the end. So even though it is cooperative, it, there's that little bit of really cool, uh, you know, friendly competition there. So obviously apart from co-op and apart from the main story <coughs> mode, there's quite a lot of side missions and side quests. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about a number of the different ones? Yeah, we, uh, and again, all these side quests are very relevant because they all give you something for Arno's progression, which makes them really relevant. And the last thing we really wanted also was to reveal everything when you do a reach high point. This game is about exploring, it's about finding your own path. So, you know, on your way to getting a chest, you might run into a, a dead body, which is one of the types of missions we have, murder mysteries. Uh, you actually get to investigate the crime scene, you get to find clues, interrogate people, and ultimately accuse somebody and get somebody in jail. Uh, we have contracts. These differ uh, greatly from the assassination contracts we had in the past, where we just spawned, uh, you know, a target in the map and just had to go there and kill that target. These are um, highly narrative, very complex missions uh, that have to do with, uh, you know, little known Parisian legends, little known characters. You know, every one of them just tells you something else about Paris and about the revolution. It's really cool. Uh, we have, uh, uh, so we have Brotherhood, we have the heist missions. Um, uh, Brotherhood missions are always also very, very uh, large scale about, uh, you know, like French Revolution stuff. So the heist missions, we have the murder mysteries, we have the contracts, we have treasure hunts. Uh, these are Nostradamus riddles. I mean, he lived in Paris, he wrote some stuff, you can follow these riddles that, that lead you to, uh, you know, the next step and the next step, and then you can actually get uh, treasure at the end. And uh, all of these riddles are always based on Paris, so by reading the database, for example, you know, we always have these databases, right? It actually gives you a real reason to read about the stuff because, you know, it gives you clues that can maybe get answered and then you can maybe get to the next step. Uh, we have uh, systemic crowd events also within the city. Um, you know, literally uh, hundreds of these quests are littered across Paris. So there's also the Café Theatre. Yes. Thing. Do you want to explain how that works? Yeah, so the Café Theatre is, uh, is sort of uh, the evolution of, uh, you know, the villa or the homestead uh, that we've had in previous games. But uh, what we did is we took something very contextual to the French Revolution. Like, uh, cafes were, were one of the reasons, uh, you know, why the French Revolution actually happened. I mean, before uh, coffee came into Europe and before they had cafes, uh, the only social places were taverns, and they were really seedy, and people were drinking uh, alcohol, so not a lot of thinking was going on there. Uh, but when you know coffee was introduced, they had these coffee houses. There were really no social classes there. Everybody was equal, and they were actually drinking a stimulant. So people started talking, exchanging ideas, and you know the, not only the revolution, but this uh, this uh, amazing rebirth in you know art and rewrite and, and writing and stuff like that, and scientific revolution happened because of these coffee houses. We felt it was really appropriate to have one in the game, so. You buy it, you renovate it, uh, and then you can actually get more content to play within the Café Théâtre. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, uh, speeches, uh, plays, music, and the more stuff you have, the more you're actually going to attract people, the more money you're going to make. Uh, it also has a lot of different rooms. There's a training room, there's a trophy room, there's a lot of different stuff in there. And then what you can do is that you can go into every single district and uh, open up sort of franchises. Uh, I like Starbucks, I guess. <laughs> so you can open up franchises, and, and uh, by, by doing that, you, you pay for that little franchise, and then what happens is uh, it opens up some missions. When you actually do these missions, uh, uh, complete these missions, it actually changes. It allows you to change the crowd ecosystem within every district. There's three factions in the game. There's uh, you know the, the National Guard, these cops that are dressed in blue. We have these political extremists that are red, and then we have the crowd itself, which is the third faction. Some people are actually armed, and they will take up arms and help you if you're fighting extremists because they don't like them. Uh, and extremists will just walk around and harass everybody, the crowd and even you. And the, the, the guards are just there to reestablish order. When you actually complete these missions, uh, you have less extremists and more allies. And this is all systemic. And because when you're performing missions, we don't turn off the toy. The, the, the actual city, systemic city, is active. Any mission you then perform within that district will have different results because different stuff can happen. You know, as you're walking around completing a mission, maybe you actually get helped by some people from the crowd that actually join into the fight, stuff like that. Let's talk about the motion capture in the game. Yeah. Um, 
Tell us about that. So um, we really improved uh, all of uh, uh, our motion, uh, performance capture technique. Like, um, you know, in previous games, sometimes we, we, uh, we captured uh, all of the facial animation and the dialogue uh, from, uh, you know, one set of actors, and then we captured all the physicality from another set of actors. And this was done separately, and then merged together into a scene. And a lot of times, this was done uh, with individual actors. So the actors that's actually, um, you know, doing the, the, the facial performance and the voice performance is doing it alone in a booth, and every actor is doing the same thing. So um, it really makes it more difficult and challenging to get something that feels like a really, uh, um, you know, a real a coherent scene where, where you have a lot of chemistry between the characters. The way we did it is different. We did uh, what we call complete performance capture. So we are um, have all the actors together. We're actually capturing uh, the performance from their bodies and from their faces and actually capturing their voices all at once. Uh, this makes for a much more credible, much more believable and much better performance from actors when you actually uh, look at the cutscenes. Also, because this is new gen, like we really have characters that are of much higher fidelity. We have this amazing facial scanning technology that we use to scan the actors. And then we sort of modify their faces to, to resemble the characters that we can see, right? Uh, so, and even the shaders, their skin, the eyes, uh, all of that, the hair, all of that detail has been improved. So, I think, uh, you know, for an open world game that's seamless and you have, you know, interior, exteriors, and these cutscenes seamlessly happen within the world, uh, I think we've gotten to a level of quality that's going to that's gonna turn a couple of heads. I think people are going to be quite surprised. And why should people play Unity? People should play Unity because this is really the beginning of a new cycle uh, for Assassin's Creed and it's all also, the I think, the new standard for action adventure genre uh, for this new generation of consoles. This, this game is really about you carving your own path through a huge systemic dynamic city. Uh, you know, hopefully every person's playthrough will be different because on your way to a mission you might uh, encounter you know 10 different stories and the ones you choose to take part in the ones you choose not to define your own unique path through that city um, i mean it's a hugely detailed beautiful city beautifully rendered it's uh, multi-layered one building out of every four has a complete interior you know these are all populated by npcs we actually have uh, dozens of monuments you can go in explore paris uh, we have, it's a multi-layered city in the sense that there's also uh, underground, there's sewers, there's catacombs. It's just an amazing sandbox. It's as close uh, to time travel as I think uh, people are going to get to experience within their lifetimes. Great, we look forward to playing more. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Why not subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the link on the screen now. And we have some more Xbox One Assassin's Creed Unity gameplay for you too.